Can you hear me now? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay. You had an answer from that. Uh, on the right side, you see the derived classifications, as we call them. They are somehow, I'm, I'm not going to into much detail on all these classifications. I'm just giving you a broad picture. You see the derived classification. The derived classifications means that they are somehow uh, connected to the core classifications. They are, as you could say, an extension, in some cases, of the core parts, some chapters. For instance, the ICD-03 is based on everything which is on oncology in the ICD, but it's more elaborated. We have the uh, ICD-10 mental and behavioral disorders, which is based on chapter five in the present ICD-10. And we have, the, uh, for dentistry, have, we have an application, we have one for ne neurology, and I think one of the most important things which we have developed after we developed the ICF is the ICFCY, children and youth version. Uh, at least two persons in the room are part of the core team of the developers. Matilda Leonardi and I were engaged in the development of the ICFCY. And as they wanted to say at the moment at WHO is that ICF and ICFCY have merged. That's not the case, I can assure you that. Uh, there are more than 200 things which have not been solved yet. And one of the most important things why the ICFCY is so very attractive is it has a very nice introduction. It's, it's less complicated than in the ICF. It's more understandable in most cases. And even that part has not been incorporated in the ICF. So there should be a lot of discussion about that as well. So at the left-hand side, you see the related classifications. Why are they there? Sometimes we talk about the... Um, parts which are also part of the WHOs, such as the ATC, which is in the middle. But why are they here in the picture? Because we see them as a suite of classifications which are needed for the health information process. They, you cannot use one standard in your rec recording everything which happens in the health information process. You need different standards and they fulfill this role in this process. You see the ICPC, at this moment, we have version 2.7 at Wonka, in the WIC, this is version, and at this moment, it's also under development. There will be a new ICPC-3 within three years, we hope. Um, you have the ISO 9999, familiar to you? You know, who of you know the ICD of the ISO? I see one hand, two hands, three, four, four five, that's not much because it's a very important classification. It's about assistive products, which are used very much. And you could see them as, as an extension to some of the e-chapters or parts of e-chapter. You can put them, connect them to e-chapters, and they are there to assist or to uh, help people in their functioning. So it's very good if you take, take notice of these kind of things. And then we have the ICNP, which is a classification which is somehow connected. It's not uh, quite, quite concrete yet how they are connected, but they are trying to connect to the central parts, especially to the ICF and also to ICHI. Nothing happens here. I'll take this one. Yeah, this one. Well, we have the WHO FIC network goals, um, that is to deliver high, high quality classification and related products. We'll come back to the related products in the presentation, especially to improve the level and the quality of implementation of WHOFIC classifications to provide, and the goal essentially is to provide comprehensive and up-to-date information on the WHOFIC implementation in every WHOFIC member state. Anyway, in every WHO, WHO member state, at the moment there are 194 member states. And it's also there to enable standardized maintenance and update the revision It's also to ensure the clinical relevance and up-to-date classification for capturing 
these diagnostic and related uh, problems. That's why the ICD-11 is almost finished. It's a, a more up-to-date representation of the medical knowledge, you could say. It is also there to ensure the logical structure and the coherence of the WHO uh, classifications. This is divided between all kinds of committees. I will come back in the next uh, slide. It's to develop and sustain the education, the training strategies and the tools for WHO classifications. And it's already mentioned in earlier presentations that it's very important to build partnerships with other, other people, with other users, especially to serve global users. Here you see the structure as it is at the moment. It's not quite capturing the reality because it's a little bit changing, but I won't go into that. Basically, we have headquarters, WHO headquarters in Geneva, and we have six regional offices, offices all over the world. Underneath that, we have the council, which comprises of everything which is underneath there, the co-heads of all committees and reference groups and go to the heads of centers. We include NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and underneath you see the committees and reference group which are present at the moment. Of course, the yellow one is for me is the most important at the moment, but for others, others other, other parts are more important. You see one thing in the picture which is not quite um, correct anymore. We had a revision steering group for the development of the ICD-11. This was uh, uh, comprised of members of different kind of groups to support the development of ICD-11. So we have collaborating centers. We have collaborating centers under designation. We have WH headquarters, regional offices, NGOs. We have academic research centers. And we also have participants not included or affiliated with collaborating centers. These are comprised all in the HUFIC network. And you can, we have a, a paper on how to behave, how to conduct yourself within the network. And you can find the paper on that, on the address below. I think the presentation will be made available to you. I suspect so. So you can check it, check it out. The committees are, as I already you saw in the picture, update revision committee. They are working both on ICF and ICD updates. The family development committee, it's an overarching committee, which is connected to all the other and it's over, it has an overview of, what, of what's happening within every group within the family. We have the ITC, uh, especially focusing on supporting material, for instance, Within this group, the, the, the present browser, ICD-11 browser, has been built. Um, and we, of course, have the Education and Implementation Committee. Then we have reference groups. And what's the difference between a committee and a reference group? Uh, formally, uh, committees are working groups who have, uh, play, play more they would say a more important role in the FDRG is, they say, an advisory group. Well, it, in practice, it doesn't work like that. They're all on the same level to us. So you have the mortality reference group, you have the morbidity reference group. How do we work? We have a strategic work plan. It's, it's a very, very formal way of working, but we do have a strategic work plan an overall plan which defines the work of all members and it um, is guided by the work plan we have. At the moment there are uh, 11 uh, tasks, you could say, within this framework. ICD-11, of course, which is a very important thing, which consumes a lot of time and energy from everybody. We have morbidity, we have mortality. You can imagine that although people are working on ICD-11, ICD-10 still is maintained. Well, it will not be up until, uh, until a certain time, but now we still have to do the updates for morbidity and mortality. We have functioning mortality, a very important topic, and we'll, I suspect it will be increasingly, increasingly important to 
all the users. And we have who fake informatics, we have primary care, which is uh, a topic within uh, and certainly under discussion within ICD 11. Uh, we have interventions, itchy, as I said. We have the links to print. Um, you heard about SNOMED CT, any one of you? Yes, the same hands? Oh no, different hands as well. Okay, <laughs> thank you. We have development of the HUFIC, which is an ongoing thing. We are changing all the time. We're trying to restructure ourselves. We have a very, we had a very working method of working in silos. And what we are trying to do, we try to get out of these silos and get more cross fertilization. Not real, of course. And then we have, of course, the HUFIC implementation. Why is the Education Implementation Committee there. Now, we have some aims. We, have, we are there to assist and advise the WHO. You can read that in, in, for implementing the uh, HUFIC in the member states, especially in the member state, but we are also trying to find ways to, to uh, get them more broadly implemented. We are there to develop the strategies for the implementation. We, what we try to do, we try to track and provide up-to-date information on classifications, the use of classifications, the level of impl uh, implementation in, in member states. What we try to do is to develop and promote the use of HUFIC training tools uh, as a standard method to get the same level of education within member states as well. So you don't have a different uh, education in uh, different countries. And we are there to ensure that coded health data are consistent. And we also work as an international support network for countries. Um, and we, what we do is support users with information resources. I will show you that later as well. We, the uh, strategic work plan for the committee for the EIC is that we, well, you see them here, I won't go into in detail on that. They are not focusing on functioning. It's, this is really on ICD and primary care and ICHI. Here we come to the, the parts of the plan which focus on functioning. And this is where we uh, collaborate with the FDRG. So to promote ICF and ICD together, uh, and education in general, on a very general level, level. We have an ICF education website, which have, you already have seen. It's not the EIC website. It has been built within the FDRG by some members of the FDRG, such as Catherine Sykes and the person you already heard several times. Um, we are developing strategies. We support the users with information, as you will see later on, and we uh, try to facilitate data collection related to, to every implementation of uh, class, uh, uh, the classification within the network by using the HUFIC implementation database. The cross-cutting work we are doing is, uh, at this moment, is mostly focused on EIC and FDRG, and we work together, we have meetings together. We had two meetings the last two days together on the icfeducation.org, the ICF e-learning tool we discussed, and we discussed the ICD 11 reference guide. Sounds strange, but I will come back to that. This is what you probably already know. You can register there. We, we will ask you to register. And... If you do that, you, if you have material available, please put it on there as well. Then we have the ICF e-learning tool, familiar to you as well, who did the ICF e-learning tool in this room? Not everyone. Do it. It's very good. It's, it is finalized. It has been finalized. No, yes, it is as, as it is now. It's not completed as such that it is. Uh, no, you can use it. It has been in, in a very, very good version. We discussed it yesterday. It has been done in cooperation uh, with the German Center and the FDRG and EIC. We have started to do the translations. There were already translations underway, but they have been done based on the old 
old files. This, this is a little bit worrisome. Uh, some countries already did the translation on the latest version and the other one need to uh, check, cross-check the translation with the latest update. As for the ICD-11 reference guide, you have a functioning part, a supplementary V codes for functioning in the ICD-11. And well, the main reason to do that is to introduce uh, users of ICD into ICF. That was the main goal to do that. Um, at the moment, it contains about uh, 47 uh, categories. There should be 48, because one of the most important is missing, and which is? That's it, education, it's missing. We don't know why that is, but we will come back to that. And this reference guide, it contains a number of uh, case studies on how to use ICF in combination with IC ICD-11. And yesterday we worked on these case studies and they seemed very problematic, but it's, it was a very fruitful, fruitful way to work together on this uh, reference guide. And I think we accomplished a lot yesterday and I think it's almost finished. And what is, I think is most important is that it will also have some reminders, not only in the ICD-11 browser, but also in the reference guide that if you want more information registered on functioning, please go to the ICF, please use the ICF. Don't use these 48 codes. I will not explain how the 48 or 47 codes now, but future 48 codes. We have the HUFIC implementation base, which is a very generic way of collecting data on country level. It's not collecting uh, ICF implementations on a country level. So you might have 10 different implementations in a country. It's not collecting that. It's, it's asking if it's used on a country level and how it is used on a country level and what it is used for on a country level. So they're very basic questions. And if you are in a country where uh, this information is, has not yet been put into the database, please try to contact the person who is responsible for the ICF or at your ministry maybe, or if you have a collaborating center, they mostly are connected to us, we know they do, but this is how we try to collect information to make it available to a broader audience. The Education Implementation Committee, we have several meetings, we have at least a yearly annual meeting and we have a mid-year meeting and what we try to do, we try to, at least we try to have um, agendas which, in which we cover the topics which are from the implementation side and education side are on functioning are covered by the EIC and from the, FDG, the functioning side they are covered by the FDRG. You can find information here, it's not very updated it's not, it's raining. <laughs> okay. You can find the information here. It's not very up to date at the moment. And, uh, I, I, I checked it and I thought it would be all there, but some information is still actual information. You can go to the line underneath the uh, cdc.gov and you can find information on the everything within what which we handle within the EIC but you will also find these topics about the ICF you will find a general introduction on ICF uh, uh, information sheet you will find there so they might be very useful for you as well so thank you thank you very much hype so I'd like to open up the floor for any questions for okay. okay, there are no questions. I'd like to thank you and also for you, Kiko, for preparing this presentation. Gives us some insight, especially for those people who are not familiar uh, about the WHO Family of International Classifications and specifically on the uh, Education Implementation Committee. So thank you very much. So the next presentation, uh, I don't know how to get it. I see, yeah. okay. 
So while we're loading that up, the next presentation will be conducted by Dr. Um, Professor, excuse me, Professor uh, Matilda Leonardi. Um, she's presenting on behalf of the Functioning Disability Reference Group, also of the WHOFIC. Um, Professor Leonardi is a director of the, I have to read it because it's a long title, director of the Neurology, Public Health and Disability Unit, and the scientific director of the Comi, Coma Research Center at the Italian National Neurolo Neurology Institute in Milano, in, in Milan. Um, and she is co-chairing um, the FDRG, or the Functioning Disability Reference Group of HUFIC, together with Professor He Jung Lee, who is a professor of physical therapy at uh, Sila University in Korea. And both He Jung and uh, Matilde started two years ago as co-chairs of this FDRG. And you've heard from Hoip that Matilde has been in the ICF community, in the ICF development uh, team from the beginning on. So she is really an expert on the ICF functioning and disability. So I'd like to ask Matilda to come up and start her presentation. Thank you very much. Matilda, you can use this. Use this. Thank you very much. Um, it's first of all my duty to thank on behalf of uh, myself and Hai Jung, the organizers for this. So Lian and Melissa and Michaela and all the team from uh, the university and from all the collaborating centers. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. And uh, I will say that my presentation will be on functioning and um, it is the result of many people thinking together, working together and uh, it is also an input I would like to give because what uh, Hoip didn't say in his comprehensive presentation is that we work as all the WHO committee and things upon request of governments. So if government require to have ICF, then uh, it would be a good thing. So let me may make a step and say from where we start. The story starts from Louise. And Louise, she is a girl with Down syndrome living in KwaZulu Natal, which is a part of Africa. And during the development of the ICFCY, the, the field trials, we, the group of experts, went to KwaZulu Natal. And then we saw her, and she was with uh, the family, many brothers, and living in a remote village. Nothing around, streets were on powder. And we were asking the family, what is she doing? I mean, what are you doing? So oh, that's so great. We found a core. She sings. I mean, she cannot do anything else. She cannot even dress herself in a room, but she sings. She has a beautiful voice. So we've been teaching her to go to the near village and to sing. And this is why code B340 has in the ICFCY the description where Inclusion says function of the production of notes and range of sound, such as sinking, which is for me dedicated to Louise. Many codes comes from a story. And in a sense, codes also tell a story because it's not just a code. Within a code, you have stories. Stories that made us to define these codes, but also stories that when you see them, are by this description. So in a sense, we could say that Africa gave singing to ICF. And uh, however, I will say that this presentation is really to say that healthcare is rich in innovations. But once innovations are implemented in one country, it doesn't mean that they are implemented everywhere. So diffusion of innovation is a major challenge. And three factors affect innovation. The first is the perceived benefit of the change. Individuals are more likely to adopt an innovation if they think it can help them. So for most people who accept or reject or innovation, benefit is a relative matter, a matter of the balance between the risk and the gains 
and of risk aversion in comparing the known status quo with the unknown future if the innovation is adopted. So the calculation of value for doing a change involves risk and benefit. The second item that affects innovation is to diffuse rapidly an innovation must be compatible with the values, the beliefs, the history, and the current needs of individuals. Third, a third factor affecting the rate of diffusion of an innovation is the complexity. Usually people tend to adopt very easily easel things. So innovation spreads faster if they're simple than if they're complicated. However, and this is a good hope for those who think that are innovators, innovation are more robust to modification than their inventors think. And local adaptation, which often involves simplification, is nearly a universal property of successful dissemination. And why I'm speaking about innovation here is because probably the most challenging of all changes is the change in health and in health culture. So introducing an innovation culture in health has a role, and I think you are very lucky. We have the possibility here to be those who create an innovation culture. And the role of people introducing innovation culture as a driving force needs to be supported by this culture. So we can be innovators if we innovate with an innovation culture. How can we introduce an innovation culture for functioning? Because this is an innovation in the health sector, although it is the oldest concept that we can have. However, in the frame of introducing new items that measure, that assess, that evaluate functioning, we need that these instruments go together with the culture of innovation. So I'm giving you seven tips. And I think that these slides can be used by you if you want. So these are for politicians because you need to convince the people around you that what you're doing is not an exercise of a fantasy person that is out of the blue. You are part of a culture of a international leading culture. 33 countries are trying to speak about an innovation in health. So seven tips that politicians, but also you, need to know. First, the first is that we all have to be aware there are issues related to definition. So the definition of health, in a sense, since 1948, state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not the absence of disease, has been accepted by all the people without so much discussion. Well, when we go and moving towards definition of the area of functioning, the problem is definition and how health and health condition impacting people's life are enormous. We have people dealing with disability, people with chronic condition, people with no communicable disease, the old people, the aging population. When we do all this silos definition, which implies different money allocation in the health ministries, are we speaking about people functioning? Well, of course, we are in the middle of the age wave. Uh, particularly for Western countries, Europe and US, uh, although we still have enormous, enormous discrepancies, which could be that a baby <coughs> born today in Swaziland and born today in Germany, they might have a life expectancy that is different with eight years of difference. So we have eight hours of flight in between 58 years of life expectancy difference. And Beside these major differences, the world trend is that the population is certainly aging. And if we see the darkest thread in this picture of the world, and we think that 2050 is only 32 years ahead, we see that the darkest, the oldest is the population. And look what's going to happen in 30 years from now. The population of the world, look at China. I mean, China is going to have an enormous impact kind of epidemiology. So aging is going to affect. But something very interesting that comes from the WHO is that whatever is your life expectancy, I that that your body is knowing a physiological decline in functioning. So these dots, they do represent countries, different countries. And you see that men and women, they have a decline in functioning, whatever is their life expectancy at the center of me. So decline in functioning, it is oh? physiological. Okay, and uh, however, we also know 
that this decline in functioning can be kept to preventive at primary, secondary, tertiary level can be kept higher and that the, the level of disability, that is the disability threshold, can be sort of avoided if we intervene with things such as rehabilitation or improvement in quality of life so we can keep the functioning of people, which is a physiological decline, or if you have a disease, it's even worse than the decline, we can keep it up. These changes in the epidemiology also make that where we are going to innovate uh, has some standard. Usually, the life of people is divided in ages. We have the first part of which you have education, and usually you have from 20 to 65, you have work and family, and then you have the leisure. What happens is that you have the so-called longevity bonus, which is 20 years plus in many countries. So maybe when we speak about how life is divided, we should think that we should change this organization and we will, have to, we will need to, have the, to use this longevity bonus somehow and split and organize life in different manners. And this is related, it's a cycle life plan. It's related to the fact that demographic change opens a lot of opportunities for innovators also for industry, but for innovators. We can introduce ourselves in these changes that we have in the world and that are provided by the different things. And so, for example, we have to innovate the system for the delivery of healthcare because the population is changing. And it is changing. And this is captured, for example, in the global strategy of aging. They introduce the issue of functioning as one of the elements to evaluate when you look at aging. So functioning is an indicator how people... Um, decline in aging and in the global strategy and action plan on aging you will find functioning as one of the things but the other big change that we had is that the medical model the one that was considered for more than 100 years the body and the person as a car where health condition is provoking a problem that you can repair and then the cars go this model which is fantastic which allowed us to have the advancement in surgery in antibiotics is not working so much anymore in the new epidemiological scenario where more and more you have the issue that biomedicine alone is not enough. First of all, because more than 50% of the world lives, lives with chronic diseases, one or more, but that is it. I mean, how many people in this room have headache? I mean, I think if I count you are 100, at least 10 of you have a headache, and at least as you're very young, only three or four have back pain. However, in population, these kind of chronic diseases, diabetes, obesity, they are increasing. And chronic diseases are creating what is called the epidemiological transition. So we have on the one side the changes that are related to aging, but also the chronic disease. And some chronic condition, they are not passed from person to person, long duration, and generally slow progression. And of course, chronic disease impact on many areas, but... For example, for Europe, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened with the slide, but for Europe, I am coordinating a project in 22 countries, and it is on employment and chronic condition, and we are evaluating the impact on employment of chronic condition. And with 22 governments, we're trying to think what's going to happen in Europe now that the baby boomers are reaching this age. So we cannot speak about mortality, we have to speak about functioning, and functioning is entering into the debate within a frame. The frame of the UN Convention. The UN Convention has been ratified, and that's a tip I want you to take home as a take home message. Almost all the countries that are represented here have governments who have ratified the UN Convention, meaning that they said that people have right to access to health, right to work. But you know, sometimes having this frame is not enough. Nobody will deny the right to work, but what people want is a job. So uh, it's always difficult to find the difference between. Uh, rights and things but in this big frame functioning enters as well as in the global disability action plan of the WHO and that's going fast here but in any case with all these diseases we are now in the position that we are sure that to say where the disease is impossible and what to cut or to add is also very difficult and this is going away from the biomedical model, completely away, because this is something new, something that goes with the 
other element that is very innovative, that is the biopsychosocial approach, which is the second tip. First, scenario is changing and definition are changing. Second, the biopsychosocial approach, we are now celebrating our 17th, we are still teenagers with the ICF, however, we are improving, and next year will be adults. So, I mean, we are almost in the phase in which we can start to count more. And being um, a teenager still, we are part of the family, but we are not the baby. The baby is the ICHI, the International Classification for Health Intervention, that is going to be delivered together with the ICD-11 in the next year. So we are becoming not sort of the youngest of the family anymore. And although we are very relevant, I think together with our little friend and sister, ICFCY, we are trying to work. I think that what I presented to you, what do we do? We take the codes. We think on the codes, codes changes, codes are not just numbers with alphanumeric entities. They have a life and they change because people change, because epidemiology change, because we need and to understand that things change. Last year in South Africa, we launched the ICF 2017, which is available on the WHO browser, which was taking into account all the novelties that came out from 2001 when we approved first the ICF. ICF, ICD and ICHI are part of the family and they compose the information base. But then we're still speaking about innovation, huh? which is my point for this presentation. And in these elements, ICF is not really entering because while ICD is compulsory, ICF is not compulsory. So governments don't put ICF into the health system information, which will be our goal in the future. And we really like this biopsychosocial approach of the ICF. We think that it helps a lot to think about innovative approaches. Also, we also are aware that we sell the possibility to code and classify the health condition and the functioning. Also adding to functioning and to measure of functioning other instruments that are already available. Okay, you can have the ICF checklist. It's just a selection of codes. We have a practical manual that is helping us. It is available on the web, and it is a practical manual that tells you how to use this classification. We have the SCF courses, mostly used in rehabilitation, but certainly widely used for also disseminating the concept. We work a lot on these classification to develop all these instruments. For example, in Hamburg, we will never forget that we've been working on the important element which is really innovative in the ICD-11 for the first time we will have an introduction to uh, the ICF and this will be done by what has been already mentioned by having at the end of the chapter chapter B the chapter on functioning entities in ICD-11 there are 48 and they were taken from body functioning structure and activity and participation they should only be used without qualifiers, just to let people know that there is a functioning issue in this diagnosis, and then you can combine with the ICF the complete profile. So the importance of defining a profile of disability and function is not only to treat the problem, but also to address people's needs in relation to their lived experience in their own context. So the best indicator of treatment needs and service outcomes is a profile of functioning. We always say that the interaction is what counts, and this is very good. If the scenario is the scenario of chronic disease, the biopsychosocial determinants are those that allow us to define some actions as also to define possible evaluation of indicators. Once we use the biopsychosocial approach, we have a description of the global picture. We say we have an holistic approach to the person. And I would say then that we are moving from genomics to proteomics to functionomics. And the functionomics, and that takes the Stefanos that has been inspiring me for this, that it is part of the innovation. Functionomics is an effort with an impact. What is needed worldwide is a common effort able to have an impact on healthcare so that chronic disease, including neurological and mental health, can benefit not only from research on drugs, but also from public health action that can be documented, that can be evaluated, and also this public health action can reduce the burden because they act on the second element of the interaction for functioning. That is not only the person, but the environment of the person. So then we know that health 
is influenced by the environment, as it is not only genetics. So inequalities in social condition give rise to unequal and unjust health outcome for different social groups. So these inequalities determine the level of functioning. And it is difficult sometimes, we forget this, we go back to the medical model and we stay on the medical model, but the level of function are also determined by inequalities and by the so-called social determinants. If you are rich or poor, if you are a man or a woman, if you live in the country or in the town, if you have education or not, the kind of housing you have. These social determinants of health are not fixed. Sometimes we have very fixed diagnosis, but what it is around the person with a fixed diagnosis can completely change and can be subject to intervention. The fourth tip for introducing and innovate with functioning is the integrated approach to care. Acting on functioning means a major shift in health and social care, and this shift is based on having the right information to make a decision, having the right incentive to make the right choice and having the right capacity to deliver them. Of course, once you measure something and once you define something, you need to know what to do. It's not only enough to say that that is the problem. And the major issue is the complexity and fragmentation of health and healthcare model across countries. We don't have in Europe, for example, a country that has the same system as others. From different continents, we have different objectives and we have heard colleagues before in the session on poster, many different realities. So we need a coherent system that also doesn't have to forget inclusiveness. Because of course, technology will help us, but technology can create the so-called technology divide. So are we inclusive once technology is evolving? I mean, we don't have to forget. If we want to be innovative, we have to take care of everybody using the best of technology. And Having very clear in mind the paradox of cold hand versus the warm hand. The more we introduce technology and the more we, in the pathway of care, the more science proceeds and technology proceeds, we can say that we are looking at a new paradox that is coming out. A lot of efforts and investments are, of course, in technology that is part of the solution of taking care of people that have a problem of functioning. They don't die anymore, they live forever, but they don't live without health conditions. And uh, technology can enable people with disability or disability to stay active in their community. But technology cannot replace the human dimension of caring. In the new models, technology enhance caring the human-to-human -human engagement, caring. Technology raises concern about the cold hand versus the warm hand and the loss of interpersonal relationship. We hear a lot, at least in my country, Italy, that, for example, the development of new robots is going to replace the care because we don't have enough family members to take care of people. So there is this increase in the different robots, for example, beer robots. Is used for mobility Nossa, so and then PEPA robot is used é for pra... ah, in Japan. and air on one robot is used for people with Alzheimer and Romeo is used for old people and is uh, sort of cuddling them with nice words but these cold hand will not replace the human interaction so technology can only be an instrument of social innovation and it can streamline processes and free up administrative resources but, but we do not have to forget that they cannot be replaced. And uh, it can be supporting workforce development of new professional skills or other things, but not replace. The six tips is to think about age-friendly And this is very interesting because the healthcare and healthcare system are shifting from hospital, this is very acute, towards this long sort of care. This is very nice. I think is a key point, but the best thing is adapt. Family members in these homes, otherwise these homes are not enough. And the definition of age-friendly home depends on the needs of the occupant, but includes general accessibility, and, for example, other issues that can be more. Gente, deixa as coisas de vocês lá na outra fala, incluindo o celular, você pode ficar com a folhinha para a casa aqui. E voltem para cá para a gente poder começar, tá? The building stock in Europe today is not fit to support the shift 
from institutional care to home-based independent living model. Some 78% of houses in the UK and 90% in Germany are not suitable for independent living as they contain barriers for people with emerging functional impairment and chronic condition. They are not equipped with the necessary digital infrastructure required for connected care services. In Germany alone, and I took this data as I was hosted in Germany, the need for age-friendly houses exceed 2.5 million already today. And in the Netherlands, there is an estimated in 2019, we need to convert 330,000 homes to become age-friendly. So when we say we move health and we open health towards an integrated uh, hospital-based, towards community-based, for some countries who have an advanced, we have forgot that this kind of data should be taken into account before making plans. So for some people, these stairs are Everest, and it is true what it is written in the Sierra Metro. The last tip, social network, really to innovate and to be innovative in the functioning, considering the functioning, a key element which has proven to be something that is affecting health more than many other elements is the presence or not of social network. And I'm doing a question to you. Can you please don't give the price? Do you have five people that you would consider your close social network to which you can ask help if you need at any time of the day or the night? If you have less than five, you might have a health problem. Because five has been considered a number that is part of the network that around you will help you to keep your health. Also, how many people of your network consider you one of those five that they can contact at any time? When do we speak about this? So, Mateus, I mean, we speak Victoria, about having the need for social relationship in the environment to stay healthy when people are already with a health condition. Before. That's prevention. Who is speaking about this? How can we innovate the debate on how societies work? If we don't have this and you will say, oh, no, no, for example, I think, well, so, so, I think I think I think Spain and Finland, and in Finland they say maximum so, net for us is three. Okay, and Poland said, no, five is not enough. We want 10. So, I mean, you might have, so that's why you understand we'll never be Europe because Spanish say seven. If I can give another point and then I just go to my end, is that we were asking, where do you meet people? The Polish people were saying, we meet them in the parish, in the church. Fine. The Spanish were saying, we meet them at the Capas bar. So we have a drink with them together. So it's fine. And the Finnish colleague, they were saying, we meet them Rafael, in, the the in the malls. So, the so, I mean, I would say this is how people encounter others and how you create social network. And social network is not independent from health. It has been proven by studies that, in a sense, the culture of functioning tells us something that nobody has to be left behind. This is beautiful Caravaggio that I love. And the common aim for functioning is participation. The culture of function, introducing the innovation of culture of function, is that the aim is participation. So functioning is the future. To create a future that is different from its past, health needs leader who understand innovation and how it spreads, who respect the diversity in change itself, and who can nurture innovation in all rich many countries. This is where we can enter the ICU. We can enter into a culture that understands that things are not as they were before the big economic crisis of 2008. Everything changed. And in this new world, with different changes, with different speed, globalization means that we share also good things, not only... So using SPF in this new world with this innovation in our background is means that we adopt the biopsychosocial vision of disability functioning in human being. So speaking about functioning today means to adopt an integrated vision of the person in all the aspects, person, the inner health, the environmental health. The biopsychosocial vision is as proposed by the SCF and framed by the UN convention. It is what we need to introduce. Where it is not there, that's an innovation we are mandated to do, only considering all phases of life. Children are often excluded by this talk about innovation. And I think, and I really claim for a children's eye 
in the group of people like you that are the innovators of the ICI. And I think innovation, uh, this is from the Sistine Chapel. Innovation is defined as the process of translating an idea or an invention into a good or services that create value. So the great innovator he has got, but I have to give you a tip. Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel and he was really thinking that in fact innovation comes from the brain, from the human brain. But he could not say that, he was in the Vatican, he was painting this important and at the time of Michelangelo in the 16th century, the logos, the idea was meant to be in the right hemisphere. And it is in the 70s that a neurologist watching at the chap Sistine Chapel then discovered that maybe Michelangelo introduced uh -huh. you can really innovate if you use your brain. And in fact, what it is pictured in the Sistine Chapel, it is in fact a graphic representation of the right hemisphere with all the brain. This is what something said. Of course, as a neurologist, when I heard this story, I said, okay, I don't know if it is true, but it is true. And I was mentioning this to a congress where I had a colleague, a cardiologist, I said, no way, Matilde. The real innovation comes from the heart. Because Michelangelo didn't want really to paint that the brain is giving the sense to the heart. So I decided, I let you choose whatever it is the brain. But I have to close. I have started with Africa. I have to close with Africa because Africa is ringing everywhere I go. I present this because I think this is crucial. It brings the ethical dilemmas. We use the classification, we use ICD, we use ICF, and we have a key question that arises from knowing. And the key question is now that you know the barriers, what are you going to do? And that's the point. I want you as to go around and do something. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matilde, for this very visually stimulating and brain stimulating presentation. Now it's your turn to stimulate Matilde's brain and her vocal, uh, vocal skills. So questions for Matilde. Yes, Tora? No, you can just say and I'll repeat your question. 